Seconds. You all good? Okay. Two. Go. Two. Go. Hello and Go. welcome to Get It Growing the uh, gardening program of the Lafayette Parish Master Gardeners and the LSU Ag Center. I'm Rob Trawick, the county agent, horticulturist, and master gardener coordinator for Lafayette Parish. And uh, with me is Janae Foley, uh, master gardener uh, here in Lafayette Parish. And we're delighted to be with you. If you were with us our last show, we mentioned that Rob is our new agent. He was previously agent in East Baton Rouge Parish, and we're delighted to have him here. He is a native of Alabama, Alabama and yes. graduated from Auburn University. And we're going to experience a lot of his horticultural knowledge here today firsthand. This is an exciting time of year in the garden. It's, you know, we're out of our terrible heat. It's fun to be outside in the beautiful sunshine, and people are back in the garden taking care of general chores and getting ready to plant some of our fall ornamentals. Yeah, some of the, the fall ornamentals, and, and one thing a lot of people don't realize is, you know, a lot of these beautiful uh, cool season annuals that we're getting ready to put in the garden, uh, they, they have uh, certain needs just like our, our woody ornamental plants that we plant in the garden. Um, most of them require an acid soil, very much like uh, azale say, say uh, some of our uh, favorite perennials uh, or woody ornamentals like uh, say azaleas, uh, gardenias, camellias. They like an acid soil very much like those. Okay. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's good to do proper bed preparation and get these, uh, you know, get them ready to go and ha have the, uh, the, 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 the roots and everything ready uh, for the plants before we put them out there. And then uh, when we plant them in the ground, we'll have much, uh, we won't have very many problems with them at all. And uh, they'll be uh, ready to show and, uh, and delight us with their flowers and their color. And now, we have examples here of, of two of the fall color plants. The snapdragons, these happen to be a shorter snap, a little uh, sort of ground cover snap. And this taller plant is a dianthus. I happen to pick these up because they're, they're the exact opposites of what we usually think. We usually think of, of snaps as being your taller plants and your dianthuses as being shorter plants. These are, these are new introductions. Both of them are, have lovely colors. We trialed this um, ground cover snap last year in the garden and it was just absolutely lovely. And these taller dianthuses are a, a neon, pinkish color, just absolutely smashing. When it gets cold, these plants take the cold. And uh, one thing to think about as far as plants, when you're, when you're designing your gardening or, garden or when you're planting these, you want to think, uh, well, at least know what the mature size is going to be. And when you know what the mature size is going to be, plant your taller plants in the back and then plant your lower plants or your shorter plants in the front. And a lot of people don't realize this. The reason snapdragons are called snapdragons is because they, 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 they actually, the little mouth part on them, it looks like they have a little mouth part where they'll open up and snap on you. So uh, they're, you know, they're a really neat little plant. Kids love to play with them and, and make little mouth parts snap on them. And uh, so uh, they're, they're, they're a really neat little plant and uh, we have a lot of fun with them. And they're very hardy. They're a good cool season annual that we, uh, that, that, that is very reliable. And like she was saying, this is one of the shorter varieties, so they they come in a wide range of sizes. And I've noticed this year, if you've been hunting, now pansies seem to be in abundance. There are, you know, almost any color pansy you want to plant now. Calendulas are in short supply. One of the uh, larger commercial people in the state had a lot of crop damage from the hurricane. So if you've been looking for calendulas, that's what's happening. So, you know, you might just have to mm. plant a few more pansies this year. Rob was uh, talking about the acid-loving plants, and one of the 
good things to do at this time of year is to get a soil test and he'll describe a little bit what you do when you when you get a, a soil test. Typically, you know, soil test uh, is one of the easiest things that you can do. It's uh, we, we uh, it's done through the LSU Ag Center. Uh, the cost is seven dollars, and you you come by our office. What you're going to do is get uh, about a pint of soil, uh, enough to fill a little Ziploc bag. What you want to do is get uh, just a representation of the area you're going to be planting in. So don't, so don't just go out and just dig in one little spot and get a pint of soil, stick it in a bag and bring it. You want to take several small samples throughout an area and then, and then take that, put it in a, in a bucket, mix it all up, put that in, in, and you can bring it and put it in this box that you have when, we, when you get it to the office. Uh, you'll fill out this form that we have uh, here at the, uh, at, the, uh, at the LSU Ag Center office and we'll take this, uh, it's sent to the uh, soil testing lab in Baton Rouge on campus at LSU. It takes about a week to 10 days and you'll get your soil test back and it'll tell you uh, all kinds of uh, information about there you're planting in. So there's not a lot of guessing involved in, what's, in, in what you're planting. It'll tell you your pH, uh, the soil pH tells you uh, basically it's a measure of your alkalinity or your acidity of the soil. It'll also tell you uh, the, the amount of phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, a lot of these different staple elements that, that we're going to want to know about uh, in, these, uh, in these plants and uh, are in the soil. And, and uh, knowing that, we can basically uh, decide, okay, we, we're going to need to either add calcium or uh, we don't need to add calcium. If our phosphorus level or our potassium level is extremely high, then we know we don't need to sit there and add that in a fertilizer. So it, it gives us a good base starting point and it also can uh, explain some problems. Maybe that w one of the reasons why we're having some problems. And, and for seven dollars, that's a very small price to pay. Uh, uh, to to uh, so you don't have to be sen sending there guessing what exactly what's going on. On the back of the form, they do have. They're going to ask you on the front what you intend to plant, and they've got a right. you know a general listing on the back. You know if you're going to grow perennials, if you're trying to grow blueberries, right. but because different types of plants have have different needs, and they will actually you know slant the the soil test toward explaining what that particular group of, of plants needs. Mm -hmm. It's also a good time now, time of year, to be doing this for two reasons. One, the laboratories are not as busy in the in the backlog in the springtime everybody gets spring fever you know they're rushing this and they get a little more of a backlog so it's going to be longer for you to get your results. If you do it at this time of year you can get your results, amend your beds if you need to and this is a great time of year to be planting perennials and shrubs and trees. Now this is the time of the year to be planting um, and a lot of people don't realize that but you know it's kind of one of those the, the early bird gets the worm so to speak and um, the, the lab right now, we have about a seven to ten, you know, this is about a seven to ten day wait. You get to uh, spring when a lot of people are putting out vegetable gardens. I mean, the soil testing lab doesn't just do ornamental gardens and, and things like that. They also do vegetable gardens. They, they do all the soil testing for the agronomic crops throughout the state, the people that are growing rice and things like this. So, so instead of having a, a, a you know, a 14 to 21 day wait. We have a you know a good seven to you know just a little seven to 10 day wait, and and also this is the time of the year when we need to be planting. This is the time of the year we need to be doing that. So it's kind of it, it's advantageous in, in in that in that area that we're going to be going ahead and getting the soil test done, and we can go ahead and and get these uh, uh, get our results back and start start uh, planting the 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 annuals that we want to do. Uh, uh, that we want to plant out there, and and like I said, it, 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 there's a there's a little uh, thing we used to say in in, in horticulture. It's don't guess, soil test. Mm -hmm. You want to you want to actually you, instead of guessing what what your uh, numbers are, it, 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 the numbers are actually right there. You you know exactly what the pH is. You don't have to sit there and guess what it is, and and, and the, you can go from there. And the soil test is actually going to come back with recommendations 
for amending your soil too. W you know, with very specific right. recommendations. If you don't understand them, you can always come to the ag office or call the ag office for help with in interpreting that result. Sometimes they're you know fairly easy to understand. Sometimes it gets a little bit more complex. Sometimes they tip tip into applications for for acres. And you have, you know, you need a little little help with that since more, most of us are not planting acres. But, you know, you can get that help at the extension office or over the telephone, too. And there's an excellent uh, publication that we do have at the, at the uh, extension office. It's called Tons to Teaspoons. And it, it, it helps break down some of these. You'll, you'll get, uh, you know, a, a ton of lime per acre, and it helps break that down into, well, it, it comes out to about 45 pounds of, of say, lime per 1,000 square feet, which is a whole lot easier to deal with and manage than 2,000 pounds per 43,560 wow. square feet. That, that makes a whole lot more sense in that. In that. So, so uh, that's a good publication that we do have at the office. Like I said, it's called Tons to, to Teaspoons, and it helps, uh, helps us break that down. And many people don't realize, too, that another important aspect of planting in the fall is to let your plant get ready, actually, for spring. The, the, the plant is actively adjusting and getting ready for, for that big burst of growth that's going to happen in the spring. Very, that's very right. Uh, plants have a hierarchy as far as what's important, what needs to be done first. Plants, more than anything, want to reproduce. They want to flower and they want to seed and they want to reproduce and pr produce this reproductive growth. Uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the fall, what, what you're doing is you're basically forcing this plant, since the ground, you still have a good warm soil, even though the, 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 the air temperature may be a lot cooler, the, the ground itself uh, is going to force the roots to start growing and, and setting themselves up to go ahead and, uh, and, and get going. Uh, like I said, the, the, the reproduction is going to be pushed off, the, the growing of the new foliage is going to be pushed off, and the plant is going to be forced to establish itself in the ground and get ready to go. And then, so, so when that's done, uh, when spring hits, when, when, when spring gets here, and as you know, in, in March, when we get those 85 degree temperatures, in March, it'll be ready to go ahead and start growing. And it's if you start planting plants in March and April and May, uh, the the like I said, because of this hierarchy, because these plants, you know, the roots are going to basically they're 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 going to be exactly what they were when you planted them, and the plant's going to start growing leaves and stems and shoots and start getting ready to put flowers out. And, and it's going to be, it's going to do that on whatever roots that were on there when you planted it. It's not going to be really set to go, uh, as far as, uh, the, uh, um, we, you know, with, it's going to be on the roots that are on there. It's not going to uh, have time to really establish. So. And it also helps the plants, oddly enough, make it through that first critical summer of ours. It, you know, it's, it's the same thing. It's just a, you know, sort of a numbers game. If they're planted in the fall, they're developing that root system. That gives them a much larger root system to take it through our brutal s first summer for them, which is going to be the hardest summer on them. You know, if you're planting them in spring, this, you, right. you're, you're, you're cutting that development period short. So, you know, on several, several, <laughs> several fronts, it's really good to concentrate your planting in the fall. We, if you've noticed our Civitan Park on Congress Street, the only time we plant there is in the month of November because there is no watering system out there. So, you know, we have this one opportunity to get those plants out there. Hopefully they'll get natural water during the winter and survive the summer. And it's working well so far because we plant in the fall. Uh, another thing I want to mention are uh, microclimates. Mm -hmm. And microclimates are uh, whether you plant on the northeast side of your house, whether you plant on the southwest side of your house. Uh, th these are very, very uh, uh, instrumental in the success in, uh, or failure uh, of, of plants. And uh, so when you're, when you're deciding where you want to put your plants, 
figure out, you know, kind of maybe just do a rough sketch and figure out where the sun sets and, and, and figure out that side of the house. That's going to be your southwest corner of your house. If where the sun comes up in the morning, that's going to be the northeast quadrant of your house. Morning sun uh, is, is a much bigger uh, or a much nicer uh, thing to your plants. Uh, it's much nicer to your plants than afternoon sun. If you've ever uh, noticed, I mean, you can just try this as a little experiment. Go uh, this, sum this, this coming up summer, go stand on, and you can do this in the fall too. I mean, you don't have to do it in the summer, but go stand on the northeast side of your house or where the sun comes up and then feel that temperature and then go stand on, and this in, this is in the afternoon, say about five o'clock when the sun's getting ready to set, and then go stand on the southwest side of your house where the sun is, is getting ready to set. And I guarantee there will be a 10, 15, possibly even a 20 degree difference between one side and the other. And the plants can, they, they know this, they, they can feel this. So, so do that, definitely go through and, and uh, you know, you can, you can feel that, that, uh, that afternoon sun, morning, uh, or, you know, morning sun, afternoon, uh, uh, afternoon sun, that, that makes a big, big difference. Those microclimates make a big difference. And it's gonna be reversely true when we're starting to think about freezing weather. Mm -hmm. You know, re reversely, that southwest corner during colder weather is gonna stay warmer. So it right. might be a good place if you're looking for a place to, you know, put some container plants and protect them during the freeze, you know, keep this reverse, <laughs> the reverse process in mind too. We were, we actually had a program yesterday at our uh, Master Gardeners meeting where we were talking about freezing. And it, it's sort of funny to talk about freezing weather when it's 74 degrees outside, but we're evidently due for some significantly bad weather. Now, no one can specifically say when that's coming, but you have you know periods and records that indicate that it's been a while since it's we've been, had a significantly hard freeze. It's been, I think, I think the last significant hard freeze in this area is 1989, so, so we're due. We're due. It's, uh, we're, we're due a, a good significant freeze. And so you definitely want to uh, go ahead and make sure you're, you're prepared on that end. Uh, when you go through a long period like that, what you have a tendency to do is uh, people get braver and braver. Uh, I don't know, maybe that may, that may not be the exact word. Uh, some people might consider it more ignorant <laughs> in a sense. They, they start putting plants out there that really stretch the envelope, that really get towards the end of that envelope. And what ends up happening is they, they start planting plants that are really should, should not be planted further north than, say, Homa. Uh, or areas like that, and then they, they, they go and they, they, they plant these. Uh, an example of that when I was in Baton Rouge was uh, bottle brush. Mm -hmm. Bottle brush was planted extensively, and we're just, it's just a matter of time for waiting for one of those freezes. Ten years ago, you wouldn't have had one person probably that planted bottle brush. Now bottle brush was, you know, is all over the place down there. And it's going to take one good significant freeze and all of it's going to die. Uh, hibiscus, the hibiscus rosa sinensis, mm -hmm. the, the typical hibiscus, the flowering hibiscus that everybody has, that's not a plant that you really would think of as a landscape plant, but people have gotten more and more, uh, I'd say, uh, they've become more and more brave, and they're planting this in, in their landscape, and what ends up happening in that situation is you, you end up with, uh, uh, you know, a plant that's just going to, we're going to get a good, good cold snap that's going to go below 30 degrees for a couple of hours, and the next thing you know, the, the, it's just going to turn to mush, and it's, uh, the cambium layer is going to freeze, and then it's going to thaw, and the plant's going to be dead. And I'm going to be getting phone calls at the extension office, and people are going to be saying, well, what can I do to save my hibiscus, and they, there's really nothing you can do. So. So uh, that's one of the things that, that has happened in that sense is, is we've had a lot, you know, like you said, people have gotten braver and braver in that sense and they've planted a lot of things 
now that they wouldn't have planted 10 years ago. And they've gotten away with it for they've a while. They've gotten away with and it. And we're going for, I mean, you know, we have to be honest here. We're going for the zinc, like these beautiful orchids, like this trade Scanthia. We're going for the color and the pop that these tropicals can give us, and that's fine. That That's a choice. We just need to keep in mind that we're due this freeze. And you might be interested in starting to collect materials and analyze your situation. I mean, look around your yard and, and start counting. Oops, I've got 25 things now that if it gets below 30 degrees, I've got to protect. What, what am I going to do with them? Do I, you know, you know, maybe these were not, I didn't pay this much for, you know, these five, I'll probably just leave them alone. You know, these four, Mm, I have a large azalea here or a boxwood. I can push them under that and hopefully it'll give them enough protection. These five, I really want to keep. So what am I going to do to protect these plants? So, you know, go out in your yard, start start doing this. Start assembling, you know, get in a corner, put, put a pile of things in the corner of the garage because believe you me, Come one evening at 6.30 when the weatherman just says, oh, there's going to be a significant freeze tonight. You're going to be rum rummaging around trying to deal with all of this stuff. Half the time it's an Arctic front that involves rain, too. So you're out there in the rain and the cold trying to address these issues. If you just, you know, start collecting a few things. Look, you know, see what old blankets you have. See what old towels you have. I have some, some old moving pads. There's a wonderful uh, new product that is better than the black pla the the visqueen for protecting your plants it's a woven white plastic that's available locally 12 feet by 12 feet and you're not going to pull that out over here yeah it, it's woven you can shove a lot of plants under it because it's it's 12 feet it's better than visqueen with visqueen the problem is that it's 30 degrees here one day and before you know it, a day or two, the temperature's 75 degrees and you're baking your plant. Yeah, the, the thing about Visqueen that you got to be very careful about, Visqueen is clear. And uh, when you cover Visqueen, you, 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 when you cover with Visqueen, you pretty much have to be ready to go out the next morning and immediately pull that Visqueen off the plants. And, and lay it to the side and uh, maybe maybe get ready to set it again that evening. But uh, since this is not clear, uh, it's not going to have that problem. But, but this queen is going to be very much like, uh, like a greenhouse in a sense. You're going to lay it over the top. Any part of a green plant that's touching the side of that this queen is going to burn it. It's just it's going to get burned, and there's just there's no question about it. There's nothing you can do about it other than you got to get up at five six o'clock in the morning and you got to pull this guy off. Mm -hmm. uh, this woven material, you don't have to do that, right. so you don't have that problem. And there's also um, available. You've seen in local garden centers the frost blankets that are lightweight. They're easy to work with. They've even come out with with wonderful products that you can slip over a, a shrub. That you're, that you're trying to protect. Those are, those are easy to work with. You can start looking at uh, your containers and if you, there's things you really want to try and save, start bringing them in, you know, like on a porch in your garage to get them used to less sunlight. You know, you don't want to have this plant out in full sunlight one day and you go in at six o'clock one night and yank it into a house. It's, it, the plant's not going to be happy. If you kind of help it adapt to a less ideal environment, it's going to be a lot less stressed when this when this cold weather comes. This is an example of a plant that you know that I'm going to have to make a decision about when the weather gets cold. I you know I can leave it hanging under a tree. A tree is going to provide a great deal of protection for it because the tree or a large azalea actually, you know, helps trap that heat. You know, an option would be just to try putting it in the corner of a, a garage or popping if you're, you know, limited for space, you have the option of popping a piece of it off and rooting it and restarting it in a basket or a bed the next or, or just, 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 you know, the, the tree example is a, is, a, is a good example of almost like what happens when you have a cloudy night. When you have a cloudy night, your temperatures generally stay warmer than if you have a completely clear night with no clouds 
and then the temperature completely drops. Uh, and, and if you're just going to have a light, say a light frost, just throw in something over the top of the plant, putting something just right over the top of it, uh, just covering it is, is not a bad idea. But if we're going to have a, a, a significant freeze, then what you're going to want to do is get, say, a towel or blanket, something that goes all the way, or, or this you know, material over here that goes all the way across, all the way to the ground, because what you're trying to end up doing is trapping in ground heat. You're trying to trap in that 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 ground heat is going that that ground's going to stay above 32 degrees. That's the reason if it ever does snow, that's the reason snow never stays there. It doesn't melt. You basically have uh, uh, it just it melts right away because that ground never gets below 32 degrees. So we put that over the top of it. We cover it, and that ground heat stays in there and keeps that 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 air temperature underneath that, that either the, uh, the, the woven material or a blanket, it keeps it right in there uh, above that 32 degree threshold. So uh, that, that makes a, a big difference right we there. We would like to take a moment too. The Master Gardeners are having a garden talk at our new pergola at the Ira Nelson Horticulture Center on November the 22nd. The topic is, how do I learn more about plants? The public is invited. It's a free event. We hope to see you there. And remember, it, you know, we're probably going to have a freeze this year. So there's two things to remember from this day. Start thinking about a freeze and get your soil test and get your plants planted in the fall so they can develop roots. Uh, so. I don't think we got started.